Dr. Lisa Black is a licensed clinical psychologist and board certified in biofeedback and neurofeedback with additional specialty in ketamine-assisted psychotherapy. She is one of UCSD's Frontiers of Innovation Scholars Program grantees and specializes in treating trauma, PTSD, post-concussion syndrome, anxiety, depression, and ADHD. And joining me today is Dr. Lisa Black. Welcome, Dr. Black. Hi, so excited to be here. We're so excited to have you. Thank you so much for making time. Uh, I know that you have an incredible amount of experience um, in, in this healing field, so I want to jump right in and get to ask you, um, you know, you describe your approach to healing as part neuroscientist and part alternative medicine. And I'm wondering if you can share more with our community about how you blend these perspectives in your work. Yeah, so th that question is always like, summarize your personality in like four sentences, right? It's like, oh my gosh, how do I do that? And even writing those bios, it's like, okay, how do I summarize this? So I, I kind of like to tell a story whenever I get asked this. Um, and, and that's kind of my, my education and my own healing story is basically everything that I put into my therapy sessions, depending on if it's needed. So when I started school, um, the bachelor's that I went to was really heavy uh, behavioral. So what, what they were is like, I even dropped a professor's class because she was like, behavior of CBT is the, is the only thing. And if you're not doing CBT, then like you're wasting your time. And it was just something it was rooted in me that I disagreed with. And I was lucky enough to go to the school. So it's a University of Nevada, Reno. Um, with Dr. Stephen Hayes, who is the creator of ACT. I took his course back in the early 2000s, uh, which dates me a little bit. Um, but uh, that class like rocked my mind, right? Like I remember sitting in his course and he's like, you know, you want to tell alcoholics to kind of like come to acceptance with the fact that they're alcoholics and being so uncomfortable with that, that feeling and being attached to like my discomfort, right? Like, why am I, why am I so uncomfortable with the thought of acceptance of um, something that is considered, you know, bad? So I ended up joining his lab the next semester and, um, and doing a little bit more work with him. So just kind of just in that one story keeps happening throughout my education. So of course I have, you know, lots and lots of book knowledge and that book knowledge is fantastic. Like I can explain to people, you know, why the amygdala or, you know, like why you're scared, talk about the amygdala, the prefrontal cortex. And it really helps people understand that their brain is just as responsible as they are, you know, or even that they're basically the same thing, right? Is how I like to, to view it. So lots of people, when I do neurofeedback and show them their brain waves, they're like, oh, that's why I'm anxious or in biofeedback when I finally get them to calm down and they're not in this like high anxious state they're like that's what calm feels like I haven't felt calm in I don't know like ever right because maybe they had a really abusive home so they always had to kind of be on and so they never really understand what that feels like where a lot of people do so throughout my education you know, my doctorate um, and my first master's was definitely health-based and my doctorate was more integrative and I got to do some really fun stuff there. Um, like we did art therapy and I did a lot more existential, death and dying, transpersonal, a lot more stuff that I felt super excited about. So all of that's wonderful and great. And of course I put the, that into my, um, my therapy, my therapeutic approach. But the other parts of it, are the stuff that I've learned on my own healing journey. So such as one of the most profound experiences of my life was um, a Buddhist retreat um, that we were in partial silence for three days. And I was like 27 years old. And uh, so most of the day there was like four hours where we would kind of have like talk time where you really were processing your feelings. So it was really like a group therapy for two, two to four hours. And I remember one of the brothers asking me, like, you know, Lisa, are you a good person? And immediately I was like, yeah, I'm a great person. I do all these things, blah, blah, blah. And then he looked at me again and was like, are you sure? And oh, my God, like my heart got stabbed, right? And I was like, I don't know now, right? Like, am I a good person? Like, 
So then you go into silence for like almost another full 24 hours and you're left with your own thoughts and your own regrets and all of those things. But what, what that experience taught me was to stop, to think, and to not just like shoot off from the hip because my brain does tend to think pretty quickly. So it just already has an answer, but to slow down and get into your body and understand what your memories do to your mind, to your body, to your thought processes, right? To your behavioral processes, to everything. And then I started to get really um, into like my own um, body journey, um, more of the somatic stuff. And there's a gazillion names for it, but just like a psychotherapy, um, they're all kind of the same, right? They might call different things, different things, but for the most part, you're looking into the body. So when I do therapy on people, it is very common for me to go, blah, 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 amygdala, prefrontal cortex, let's look at your scans and let's do this next X, Y, and Z. And then I'll be like, okay, tell me about like, where in your body do you feel that? Is it a particular chakra or is it like your little toe or tell me what you feel and is it hot and is there a picture to it and really trying to um, get uh, people to understand that the way through healing especially through trauma is the whole system if you just focus on one thing it's like taking a squirt gun to you know an infernal fire you're like trying but like nothing's really really putting anything out. So I know that was so long, but hopefully uh, I'm glad that you indulged me to kind of tell that story is um, in essence, what I'm trying to say is like, yes, I have several years of education, but I also have several years of life education. And I really believe that kind of putting it all together into one really, really creates for a strong therapy. I love that. I really love the metaphor of the little squirt gun and the inferno. And <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. And definitely I can hear the, the, the idea of approaching the whole system by getting to blend all yeah. of these perspectives and really bringing that to bear on this kind of care. And um, I know just from talking with other folks that it can be a great comfort to see things couched in, in medicine and in science. And there's also this felt experience, this embodied part that really can speak to the, the whole truth that people may be feeling and not able to name. Mm -hmm. um, oh, that's so exciting. Well, I, um, I know that uh, you, and you've mentioned already, but you um, work with ketamine assisted psychotherapy. Yes. I wonder if you could share a little bit more about um, how did you first encounter CAP? How did you come to incorporate that modality? Yeah. So opportunity is really what that comes down to. Um, I, you know, was a, an intern at the University of San Diego. And then I just transitioned into the job because I um, started the neurofeedback program there. So I was pretty stuck in that job, right? Pretty attached to that job because like I was lead of the program that I started. And then eventually when I decided to leave, um, which was actually only last summer, um, so creeping on a year now, but last summer, um, it was because of these opportunities were at the UC. I'm sure they'll catch up eventually, but, you know, ketamine's not offered there yet. And I work with massive trauma and I felt, again, like we were doing some great work, but there were still pieces missing. So when I left, um, I had an opportunity um, at Kaizen, which is where I'm at now. And actually in one week, I'll be moving to Santa Cruz. So I'll be joining Santa Cruz Integrative Medicine. But currently, I am still at um, in San Diego at uh, Kaizen Brain Center. And they offer Spravato there. So I was like, hey, you know, can, can you let me do this? And he was like, absolutely. And um, so we started doing CAP after, of course, um, I took some training. And I would consider that, which I didn't know at the time, right, because I'm still learning, um, what would they call psycholytic doses, uh, you will you will kind of go on a little bit of a journey, especially if you're sensitive to the medications. But um, most of the time you are still awake, aware, and you can kind of talk. And um, so that's kind of how I accidentally started. I thought that that's kind of my training had kind of covered that and that's what we were doing. So I thought that's kind of what everybody was doing. And then I was lucky enough to take um, Wolfston's, um, Phil Wolfson's um, advanced training, where he does a lot more journey doses, but they also showed psycholytic, like, um, 
I saw Cyphalytic done with e- e- EMDR and now in a month I'm going to be trained in EMDR because I was like, whoa, that really worked really well. Um, or at least that one one that I saw, it's only an N of one. So, you know, I'm not going to get too excited. Um, but it was just like, wow, there's a whole world here. And I'm like, oh, look, what else can I do? And, um, and then we were talking about things like adding oxytocin and stuff and all things that I need to like do more research on and, um, you know, really get into depth about like what works, what doesn't work. Um, you know, and of course, when it comes to um, like psilocybin and MDMA, I'm so hopeful that, you know, like within the next year or two, that that will be um, legal and available more to the public. So there will be all of those opportunities that oh, I'm hoping that will come, you know, shortly, um, you know, down down the pipeline. But at this new practice, um, they give me a little bit more flexibility on doing kind of both. So psycholytic doses and uh, journey doses, which I think both have, you know, and I'm a both person, I'm an and person, right? Like I think both um, always have a plus to them and, um, and really get to see, see people work. So, yeah. So anyway, it was opportunity is really um, what I got into it, but I had to get out of kind of a major system to be able to give me that opportunity. Wow, I'm I'm very glad you you did and were able to find ways to try that out and bring this kind of healing experience to many people and also kind of adjust it to be what's right. It sounds like there's, you know, there's these different options, um, the psycholytic and the journey doses, so that people can actually find get tuned into the right level of healing yes. for them. That's amazing. Um you you've mentioned uh Previously, um, a couple techniques that I want to ask a little more about, um, specifically neurofeedback and biofeedback. I wonder if you could tell us about them and how they play a role in your practice. Yeah, those are my first loves, right? So, um, of course, I was taught therapy, but oof, when I started adding bio neurofeedback in, and I did it on myself as well. So, you should know that basically everything I've done, I've tried it on myself, because I, I think you really need to understand what it feels like. Um, when I first did neurofeedback on myself, I remember getting this incredible understanding that I had more control um, than I did um, over my brainwaves, over my thought processes, over my emotions. Even though, you know, as trained as a, you know, um, a psychologist and neuroscientist and all of that, I still didn't, I guess, have a really, really good personal understanding of what it meant to control your brainwaves. So I should probably reverse and say like what they are first. So I apologize about that. Um, So neurofeedback and biofeedback are just body feedback, right? So it's built into the word feedback. So neurofeedback is feedback about your brainwaves. So we train those brainwaves by giving you feedback, right? So if we want you in low beta, which is a very like popular... Um, one for attention, concentration, or for reduction of anxiety, then basically give you reward and also what they call punishment. I call punishment that a lot of people call, um, they inhibit the waves. Um, They give you like not so pleasant noises, like screeching noises or something like that, or like the picture will disappear if you're not in the brain, right brain wave that we're looking for. And then when you are, um, like let's say we're sticking to low beta, then like the picture will come in or a picture will start to play again, or the music becomes um, a little bit more peaceful, more melody, things like that. And the body's like, ooh, I like this better, I like this better. So then it tends to hold that brain wave because it's getting some positive reinforcement. And then you're like, whoa, that was really fast, right? I did that myself. And then we practice. I do it where I don't do technician-based, and I'm not saying that technician-based um, is terrible by any means. It's not, it's great. Um, but I, I personally like to do it with therapy. So I'm with the person and I'm giving them emotional feedback as well as the the equipment is giving them um, technical feedback, if you will. So a lot of times um, I'll be, I'll hear a certain noise and I know that they're like overthinking or they're obsessing and I'll be like, are you thinking about lunch? <laughs> you know, like, are you thinking about your to-do list? And, uh, and they're like, oh God, you know, you caught me. And, and we kind of laugh, we joke about it. Um, you know, because the the sounds and the feedback are are pretty specific. And when you've done it over, like for years, 
you can really fine tune to like pretty much what they're thinking, or at least the general, the general theme of what they're thinking. So they see me catch it and I'm not even, you know, like in their head. Right. And so they were like, Oh, I, I was, and okay, so let's pull myself back. And that therapy also does a really great job at compassion. Um, so a lot of people are really like, ah, you know, like I couldn't hold the green, you know, and I, I, the picture faded out. I'm so frustrated and I can't figure it out. And then I have to kind of come in and say like, you know, stop being so hard on yourself and just gently bring yourself back. And they start to realize what that, what that is. Additionally, what neurofeedback, one of the other uh, therapies that I really love to do is um, alpha theta. And I think that's like, very similar, and I really don't have any but any proof, but anecdotal proof at the moment. It's very similar to like a psycholytic dose of ketamine, in the sense that it like takes you to your theta state, which is just between awake um, and sleep, and it allows memories to come up. It allows you to process things with um, without that prefrontal cortex being so on, right? And so like eek and and scary, everything's scary. Um, what the difference is, um, between ketamine is that kind of like, kind of pushes it forward, <laughs> whether you like it or not sometimes and neurofeedback doesn't really. So you have a, like, you're, you're fully conscious and you have a lot more control over it. And then, um, biofeedback is anything body-based. So peripheral nervous system. So that's going to be your breath, your temperature, your heart rate, um, sweat that comes on your skin. And we teach people how to control that. So people are pretty blown away when I tell them you can control your own temperature, right? You can, you can control it through breath. You can control your own heart rate. And that's really, really excellent for things like panic. So I'm, you know, I feel my body, it's starting to, you know, get into the the sympathetic nervous system state. I know my exact breath rate that takes that back down to the parasympathetic nervous system um, state and I what I have control over that, right? So those two are just really awesome pairs when you're teaching somebody that they have way more control um, than than they think. But I will add this, and this is this is oh, I could even hear some of my patients get so frustrated with this statement. The control is not in the control, so it's in allowing and being and not overthinking and controlling. So like my real like OCD, high anxiety individuals sign up for this and they're like, I'm gonna control my brainwaves. And then they slowly figure out that the control comes more from letting and mindfulness. Um, and that frustrates them in the beginning and then they end up you know, obviously being okay with it at the end. So that those two therapies, again, I think everyone in the world should do. I'm a little bit biased, but you need to learn more about how your body works is incredible. That is so inspiring to get to think about making tangible and visible this, this process that's often really hard to see. Yeah. It sounds almost like an inverse superpower, you know, it's like, the, the superpower, the mastery comes from being and letting go of control and watching and, you know, watching things pass, which is um, so exciting to hear, especially as someone who identifies as a little bit of an anxiety control type person. It's like, just let it go. Just let it be. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, that's really powerful. Um, I, I uh, have read from some of the uh, work that you do that you have found combining treatments, like combining neurofeedback or biofeedback or alpha theta with um, ketamine assisted psychotherapy or general psychotherapy is really effective. I wonder if you could just share more about about how that works, how you came to kind of uh, intermingle those things and and what it does for your patients. Yeah. So when you're taught this, um, especially bio and neurofeedback, um, again, the technician based um, way of doing things is is really popular because it, it you can kind of give it more access. Again, it's kind of like a little bit cheaper, if you will. I don't know really how else to say it. It's just like a little bit cheaper and you can do it. Like you can have several machines and you can have like one person watching several machines or just kind of, again, like graduate students or something like that, that are learning about it, that <laughs> might not even be being paid. Wink, wink, we all know and have been there. Um, and, uh, you know, so again, it's, more cost um, efficient, if you will, 
But I find that the wisdom that, you, you know, when you've been in something for a really long time, like I've been doing bio and neurofeedback, you know, for nearly a decade. And I have, I've seen so many of like my concussion patients versus my anxiety patients versus my trauma patients or all of them together, right? Like they hold all of those diagnoses um, that they need a little bit extra to get out of their own head and to get permission to be kind to themselves, um, especially my high anxiety individuals. So when they view it as a competition, it, it tends to not go well, right? But when I'm like sitting on their shoulder and my patients will even tell me that, like, I hear you on my shoulder, or like even, you know, in the, uh, in the outside, in the public, like stop being so mean to yourself, be kind to yourself, like relax, let things flow. You know, you need that voice because that voice doesn't naturally exist inside of you for whatever reason. And so you kind of need that additional. So that's combining the psychotherapy and the relationship. I think, you know, talking about the therapeutic relationship and just how powerful that relationship can be, period, um, you know, is, is fantastic. Um, speaking of, I have my... My, my co-therapist, I know I'm pausing to like show you my co-therapist. She just came through the door. So Lexi does therapy with me. So this is part of that combo. Um, Hi, Lexi. Hello to everybody. Oh my gosh. Um, so she does therapy with me. So that's part of my combo therapy, if you will. You came in just at the right time, you smarty. Um, she helps like calm people, right? And she's like this ball of unconditional love. So talking about that therapeutic relationship, as I'm leaving, um, one of my patients yesterday was like, Dr. Black, I just really, really, really want you to know that I'm going to, and my ego was like, oh, she's gonna miss me. She's like, Miss Lexi. <laughs> and I was like, oh, a stab in the heart. She's like, I'm gonna miss you too. But I'm absolutely only gonna miss Lexi. Um, so you know, that, that therapeutic relationship. So sorry, digressing, I know, getting back on point. When I add the, um, the therapies, which is psychotherapy, but also um, a neurofeedback um, with the, um, with the ketamine, sorry, my brain went away. Uh, it is insanely powerful. I mean, like, like I'm, I'm so excited to be able to do both. So one of my absolute favorite protocols. Um, and these were just protocols I kind of stumbled upon. Um, they go a little bit with the Spravato protocol, um, but it took me a little bit of time to figure out like when to add the extra therapies and when I thought was going to be like the most um, therapeutic. So like, for example, like doing neurofeedback first and then ketamine or bio, then neuro, then ketamine, like what was, what was the perfect mixture? And uh, what I found, especially for massive trauma that likely has repressed memories, um, I like to do ketamine first. Um, so it's usually twice a week ketamine for a month. And then when we move to once a week ketamine, we add neurofeedback twice a week in. And then we kind of go to the next month where we transition out of ketamine again. So we go every other week while continuing neurofeedback um, for twice a week. And if they need biofeedback added in there, that's an easy one to just kind of like throw in, you know, wherever we need to kind of throw it in. So one of my patients described that process as um, if, his, if his life was a plate, a glass plate, and trauma smashed that plate, that ketamine picked up the big pieces and neurofeedback helped him pick up the little pieces. I really find that ketamine offers fantastic insight and that neurofeedback offers fantastic practice and integration, which is missing piece a lot, which is a missing piece a lot in psychedelic work is you have all this insight, but what the hell do I do with it, <laughs> right? Like, oh, great, hey, here's a basket of, of all of my, all this knowledge and I don't really know how or what to do um, with that knowledge. So uh, neurofeedback really, really helps, uh, you know, push that and kind of put it together. And then if individuals are really detached from their bodies, of course, adding neurofeedback or biofeedback in there is um, an incredible resource because then they get to understand this is what my body feels like. And as we know in trauma, um, people get quite shut off to their body because, I mean, that was 
safe, right? That was the point is their body had trauma. So it was better to kind of do that kind of like severed head where the body doesn't exist. And we see a lot of trouble that comes, you know, from, from living that way. So getting back into the body um, can be an experience as well. So of course it's my favorite. I love to combine stuff. I'm an and, 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 and therapist um, and, and love to dabble in lots of different things. I love the integration being combined right in to this combination of treatments that you can, you know, get to pick up the big pieces and the little pieces um, right within this process. Because like you said, this is integration is um, often the afterthought of a lot of care. There's a lot of insights. And we think that, that having that alone will help us bring it into our daily lives. But really, we need this integration support. It's so yeah. vital. And I, I will add one of the other things that I do that's a teensy bit different for some, from some, not all, is, um, <coughs> sorry, I'm still recovering from actually COVID, yay, so I'm a little bit um, still stuffy. Um, what, and ketamine, um, what I do that's a teensy bit different is in the psycholytic doses, I am doing therapy, right? And it it is not always just like Socratic questioning. Sometimes I do challenge. And sometimes I have people do their own thought challenges um, in those ketamine sessions. And then in the journey doses, I like, and again, this isn't um, for everybody, but I like to do therapy right as they're coming out. So <coughs> I'm taking advantage that there's that they're coming right out of, of the session they're they're still a little under the influence of the medicine and their their memory as we know just like dream state memory is like fresh it's right there right and then they're still so open and so available to chat that i wait until they can chat and then i do an hour of therapy then and so my sessions are a little bit longer because i want to take that opportunity um, i can do it the next day obviously if somebody's feeling really uncomfortable or something but I like to catch it, catch it in that window. Um, and I know some people do that as way, some people don't, but that's just the way that I prefer to do it. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, I really, I, I love that you've given so much thought to where in the cycle is the best point and to get the most impactful and effective healing. Yeah, that's really, um, that is, I think, the knowledge that many of us are seeking these days of, you know, how do we actually get in the nitty gritty and work with this stuff? Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Um, you mentioned uh, trauma just a few minutes ago, um, and I know that many people really come to psychedelic medicine because of a past history of trauma. And I know that can include, you know, physical symptoms like TBI, concussion. It can include uh, mental and psychological symptoms. You know, you'd even mentioned things like repressed memories. I know that you focus on trauma, and I wonder if you could share a little bit more about um, how you facilitate healing for folks who are coming in with that that particular type of trauma experience. Yeah, so that that's where that neuroscientist alternative practitioner comes in. So obviously, I, I, I was uh, I specialized in TBI because I was the psychologist for UCSD's um, sports concussion clinic. So um, for, I think it was like seven years now. And um, man, the stuff that I learned in there is absolutely amazing. Um, you know, so I have knowledge of things like VOMs, like eye movements, saccades, things like that. I also gained an incredible knowledge. Um, I want to call it like a booklet, if you will, about like return to learn, return to exercise, return to work, return to driving, right? Things like that and how specifically how to do that. Um, and a lot of the old ways of thinking, especially with concussions, um, usually can either not help or sometimes even harm, you know, kind of like um, one of the old ways of thinking was like, okay, if you have a concussion, just go in your room, shut off the lights and don't listen to music or anything, right? Until you're healed. And what we're finding, um, of course, is like, especially for our sports people, is that causes depression. Um, and it's like, well, you lock yourself in a room where you're used to being social every day. It causes depression. Imagine that. And, um, and then therefore they, the, again, that meaning, um, that we are all seeking, um, in life, uh, it kind of gets sucked away from them. So the depression starts to kick in and then their concussion symptoms don't heal as fast, um, or sometimes, you know, at all. 
So a lot of that um, knowledge for the physical um, part of uh, concussions and trauma, um, I am 100% you know, educated in <laughs> um, more than the average bear. Not that I know everything, but we try. Um, and then the other half of that is um, honestly the, the relationship um, and holding space. So I have, I'm kind of, I'm a believer that like all of us are traumatized. We just have a tendency to say like what we've gone through um, isn't trauma because maybe something has, you know, someone else has gone through something worse, quote unquote. Um, but that it's all relative and that we need somebody to kind of tell us it's okay that this affects us. Um, and especially like chronic trauma, that's like more covert, you know, that, that one can sneak in and it can really lead to like narrative issues, you know, where we have a thought process about ourselves, And even if it's not a conscious thought process, it, like, it's not like a little worm that gets into our head and ends up, um, showing up in our behaviors, but then we're confused of why. So in essence, like connecting that relationship, um, that therapeutic relationship and saying like, okay, we're going to dive into it. And maybe what we find is a surprise that maybe it's not as bad as we thought, or maybe it's extra bad, you know? And, but either way, like I have your hand and we're going to go into the dark together and we're going to come back out. And one of my favorite ways of doing it again, a little bit differently, is and it goes with my name. And so my my patients joke with this um, that my name, Doctor Black, is because I was meant to like go into the darkness and, 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 and into the the blackness, if you will, because I actually like to view our trauma experiences. Um, I won't say as far as positive. But what I'm trying to say is that there's like a meaning and an essence there when we go through something and then somebody helps lead us kind of through it again. So let me kind of give an example because I know I'm stumbling over my words a little bit. Is like I've gone through something really terrible and I feel really alone and that feels horrible, right, and isolating and I'm scared and I'm depressed and that's awful. And then there are people, you know, like a therapist or a friend or um, even in a relationship that says, I'll hold your hand. Let's go through this. Let's organize it. How do we, you know, make sense of it, um, understand it, but obviously it never, ever makes sense, right? Like, you know, we can intellectualize trauma, but it never really makes sense. So the best that we can really do is like organize it and then take the things that we've learned from it. And that one thing could just be learning how to let somebody else be vulnerable with you, kind of hold your hand through that darkness and then come back out of that darkness. There's something about that that's like an, inc an incredible part of life. And it adds a lot of living to life. And I do think that it's unfortunate that it comes sometimes um, with trauma um, but I'm always reminded of like Viktor Frankl's book, right? Man's Search for Meaning, where he had gone through horrific things and the, the things that came out of it, his insight that came out of it, the friendships that came out of it, right? There's this like incredible depth that comes um, from those types of experiences. So I'm a practitioner that really likes to definitely not like, oh, hey, let's look at the positives. Like, that's not it. Um, but like, what did we learn? What does that feel like? And when you get something from that trauma, a lesson from that trauma, it like sinks into your body and it feels grounded and it feels real. And a lot of individuals, I think in this day and age are missing just that, that kind of realness of connection. Um, and, you know, Unfortunately, trauma can kind of be a vehicle for that. There's other things that also can be a vehicle for that. Um, but that is what I like to focus on so that we at least have um, that connection, that understanding that somebody else was a witness to what they went through um, and that they kind of came, you know, went to the dark and then kind of came back out. So hopefully I answered that question. Sometimes I go on tirades. <laughs> <laughs> they come back out my students are always like oh is she gonna keep talking right like oh man um, <laughs> hopefully hopefully 
hopefully answered your question. Definitely. Yes, that was wonderful. Thank you for, for exploring it. And I think you really spoke to both the, you know, the the clinical side of how this is done, but also kind of what that experience of, you know, walking through the darkness, like you said, and coming out the other side, what that can be like for people. Um, I want to just show your website real quick as a as an invitation for folks to learn more. Do you have any other um, recommendations if people want to connect with you? Um, so I'll, I will be at um, Santa Cruz Integrative Medicine, and I think that website is Santa Cruz Integrative Medicine dot com. Um, the Dr. Lisa Black dot com. Um, you will have a landing page. But we're diligently working on getting all of the information. I had a page up that was more geared to just like neurofeedback. And then when I added ketamine, I just wanted to wipe it and add a lot more education on there. So that's what we're working on with that. But my contact information is on there and it's also on Santa Cruz um, integrativemedicine.com as well. Perfect. And I'm just going to Santa Cruz integrativemedicine.com. And I'll make sure for folks watching, this will be linked um, below in the description and in the blog. Um, Dr. Black, I can't thank you enough for making time to spend with us today. Thank you for being here and for sharing your wisdom. I, I, I greatly appreciate it. I, I just loving everything you're doing, Jen. I appreciate all of your hard work. Oh, thank you. Mm. All right, let me end this. Dr. Lisa Black is an alumnus of Alliant International University, San Diego, where she earned her doctorate in clinical psychology with a specialization in integrative psychology. She is a licensed clinical psychologist and is board certified in biofeedback and neurofeedback with additional specialty in ketamine-assisted psychotherapy. Dr. Black completed her postdoctoral training at the University of California, San Diego. She is one of UCSD's Frontiers of Innovation Scholars Program grantees, which offered grant support for her pioneering work to develop and implement neurofeedback services into UCSD Health's Family Medicine Program. Continuing her work at UCSD, she was lead therapist for biofeedback and neurofeedback services and psychologist for UCSD Health's Sports Medicine Concussion Clinic. Dr. Black is well-versed in treating trauma, PTSD, post-concussion syndrome, anxiety, depression, and ADHD, ADD. She also enjoys working with those focused on improving performance and thriving. Thanks.